Hello there, my dear students. Today we're going to be looking at Soliloquy of the Spanish Cloister by Robert Browning. So as we do with all of our poems, we're going to go ahead and read the entire thing through first, and then we will go back through and annotate and analyze for the elements of poetry and for deeper meaning. So here we go. Soliloquy of the Spanish Cloister. Grr, there go my heart's abhorrence. What are your damned flower pots do? If hate killed men, Brother Lawrence, God's blood would not mine kill you. What? Your myrtle bush wants trimming? Oh, that rose has prior claims. Needs its leaden vase filled brimming? Hell dry you up with its flames. At the meal we sit together. Salve tibi. I must hear wise talk of the kind of weather, sort of season, time of year. Not a plenteous cork crop. Scarcely dare we hope oak galls, I doubt. What's the Latin name for parsley? What's the Greek name for swine snout? Whew, we'll have our platter burnished, laid with care on our own shelf. With a fire new spoon we're furnished and a goblet for ourself. Rinsed like something sacrificial, ere tis fit to touch our chaps, marked with L for our initial. <laughs> there his lily snaps. Saint, forsooth, while brown Dolores squats outside the convent bank with Sanchicha telling stories, steeping tresses in the tank, blue, black, lustrous, thick like horse hairs. Can't I see his dead eye glow, bright as twere a Barbary Corsair's? That is, if he'd let it show. When he finishes refection, knife and fork, he never lays crosswise to my recollection, as do I in Jesus' praise. I, the Trinity, illustrate, drinking watered orange pulp, in three sips the Aryan frustrate, while he drains his at one gulp. Oh, those melons! If he's able, we're to have a feast. So nice. One goes to the abbot's table. All of us each get a slice. How, how go on your flowers? None double. Not one fruit sort can you spy? Strange. And I, too, at such trouble, keep them close-nipped on the slide. There's a great text in Galatians, once you trip on it, entails 29 distinct damnations, one sure if another fails. If I trip him just a-dying, sure of heaven as sure can be, spin him round and send him flying off to hell a manichae? Or my scrofulous French novel on gray paper with blunt type. Simply glance at it, you grovel hand and foot in Belial's gripe. If I double down its pages at the woeful sixteenth print, when he gathers his green gauges, ope a sieve and slip in it, or there's Satan. One might venture pledge one's soul to him, yet leave such a flaw in the indenture as he'd miss till past retrieve, blasted lay that rose acacia we're so proud of. Hi, zai, hine, ust, there's vespers. Lena gratia ave virgo, grr, you swine. Okay, my dears, now that we have read the poem with much feeling, let's move on to the analysis uh, using our elements of poetry, specifically our tiplis. That is tone, internal structure, poetic devices, language, that is diction, external structure, speaker, situation, and setting. Now we know, because we've done this before, that uh, even though this is a handy little acronym to remember, a little mnemonic device, um, we and we remember it with tipless, but we're actually going to start at the end, speaker, situation, and setting, when we go to try and interpret. So in the very beginning here, we have... Grr, there go my heart's abhorrence. What are your damned flower pots do? If hate killed men, brother Lawrence, God's blood would not mine kill you. Clearly, uh, we have uh, a first person uh, because we see here, I must hear. So we have first person, we have a first person speaker. What can we know about this first person speaker? And, um, and here, 
I'm actually going to change over to the color that I've indicated here with speaker if we do some annotations. So I'm going to use my little pencil here. And we know that um, we see God's blood would not mine kill you. Oh my. Well, um, that seems a little severe, don't we think? <laughs> so uh, and let's just erase that. We're going to erase that line. Uh, here it goes. Okay. So, uh, we also see that there is uh, another character that is spoken about here, and that is Brother Lawrence. Oh, no, not Brother Lawrence. Okay. So, what about Brother Lawrence? Well, clearly, we can see that our speaker has a hatred. If hate killed men, Brother Lawrence, God's blood would not mind kill you, which should make us wonder, of course, why? Why? What possibly, what could Brother Lawrence have possibly done to uh, enrage our speaker so much? We also want to figure out um, perhaps a bit of setting as well. And so if we were looking for setting, first of all, we see here at the top the Spanish cloister. So, okay, what is a Spanish cloister? Um, if you look it up, which we should, any word that we don't know, we can circle or we should look it up. Um, but a Spanish cloister would be like a monastery. So if we looked that up, we would find out that our speaker in all likelihood lives at a monastery. Even if we didn't know what cloister means though, um, we could have uh, some clues as we go through uh, at the meal they sit together. We see that um, this speaker, we see Latin, um, and what else do we see? So there is Latin spoken. Further down, we see um, mention of uh, the Trinity here, and in Jesus' praise. Um, and uh, even further down in the poem, uh, onto the next page, we can see them talking about, oh, actually here we have the abbot's table. Uh, and so if we really look at these clues, we can figure out that, um, that this is a monk. So that's who this is. This is a monk at, um, at the, at a, in a monastery. And I'm trying desperately to get this to erase, and for some reason it's not erasing, but <laughs> we'll figure that out in a minute. So, our speaker is a monk. Our setting is a Spanish cloister. And then we need to fin figure out situation. And so situation, which we're going to use blue, what is our situation? Um, as we progress through the stanzas of this poem, we can see that... Um, that each stanza is some little situation where Brother Lawrence has to, uh, is in contact with our speaker and our speaker clearly does not like him. So uh, at the meal we sit together and we, we should make note, and of course this goes towards poetic devices. Let's use some of our green here. Salve TV, but this is all in italics, yeah? So that's in italics. Not a plenteous court crop, scarcely dare we hope oak galls, I doubt. What's the Latin name for parsley? And uh, and yet we see that all of that, that is supposed to be the words of Brother Lawrence. So our poet uses uh, italics to, to show us that um, our speaker is mocking Brother Lawrence. We're hearing his conversations. And um, as we move through the poem, we will see more examples of, um, of uh, Brother Lawrence's uh, conversation and our speaker's response to that conversation. So um, here we he see in this stanza here that he is talking about the meal that they have and he mocks them again. He, he, there, his lily snaps. When we, as we continue on, the tone, and this is, uh, we could perhaps mark this in red for tone. Um, we have, uh, that is, if he'd let it show. Um, 
the hee hee, there his lily snaps. Um, let's see, even down further on, uh, we have uh, I too keep them at such close trouble, close nipped on the sly. It's a really, it's a really bitter, mocking tone. Um, he is, he is trying to sabotage everything that uh, Brother Lawrence does, and we really have no idea what Brother Lawrence has done. And and actually, if we go through and we look at Brother Lawrence's language um, here, where we have the italics, he really doesn't seem like such a bad guy. <laughs> And yet, uh, when we move down to this section here, Saint Forsooth, uh, while Brown Dolores squats outside the convent bank with Sanchicha, well, now we have two other characters here, two other characters. Brown Dolores squats outside the convent bank. Okay, well, if it's a convent, then Dolores and Sanchicha are in all likelihood nuns. And they are squatting outside the convent bank, perhaps on a riverbank, telling stories, steeping their tresses. And what are tresses, my dear students? So this tresses are hair. So they have their long hair. But look how our speaker describes them. Blue, black, lustrous, thick like horse hairs. He's watching them. Our speaker is actually watching the nuns bathe and wash their hair on the bank. This is a bit creepy, my dear students. So, and yet, what does he say about Brother Lawrence? Can't I see his dead eye glow? Brightest for a Barbary Corsair. And again, if you didn't know what a Barbary Corsair is, you should look it up. But it's a pirate. So he is comparing Brother Lawrence to a pirate, a Barbary Corsair, that his dead eye is glowing as if he were a lecherous pirate. But, my dear students, who is watching the nuns wash their hair? It's our speaker. It is not Brother Lawrence. So he is what we call a hypocrite. And as we move through the poem, we can see that with each successive stanza, uh, he compares himself to Brother Lawrence. Oh, well, he never lays his, his knife and fork in the shape of a cross to praise God. And uh, I illustrate the, the Trinity, that is the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, by drinking my orange pulp in three sips, but he drains it at one gulp. So he finds fault with everything. But not only does he find fault with everything that, um, that Brother Lawrence does, that's not enough. In this last stanza, we actually see where he is physically taking measures to sabotage the things that Brother Lawrence does. He says, oh, how lovely, look at those melons. And it wouldn't it be nice if we each get a slice of those melons? And he says, oh, but your melon vines have no flowers, so they can't turn into a fruit? That's strange. And then of course we see here, oh, and I too, at such trouble, keep them close nipped on the sly. So in secret, he is going out and cutting off all of the flowers on poor brother Lawrence's melon vine so that none of them will ever turn into uh, melons. And so he will never have any of them at the abbot's table. So he is uh, mean and vengeful and uh, spiteful. So we see that um, throughout the progression here of throughout the progression of the poem, we see that it starts out, well, it's not just that he doesn't like him or he's annoying or he has to listen to him, but he projects onto Brother Lawrence the very things that he himself does. That is, he sins and he is a hypocrite. And as we move through the poem, it gets worse and worse. So we should see, my dear students, a, a, an increase in this very negative tone, but also we see that it's not enough for him to think these things. He's, he's taking action. And this will lead us into uh, the second part of the poem. So in this last section, our last three stanzas of the poem, we see that, uh, again, there's a progression of what our speaker is willing to do to, uh, to trip up Brother Lawrence. So here 
we see there's a great text in Galatians, once you trip on it, entails 29 distinct damnations. So he says, oh, well, if I can just get him to read this, this is sure to send him off to hell. So now it's not even, this is moving beyond, gee, I don't want his melons, I don't want his melon vines to flower so that he doesn't get any man. Now he's talking about actually sabotaging his soul and sending him off to hell. When we move into the second to the last stanza here, we see that he says, oh, I'm going to lay a trap for him. He says, my scrofulous French novel, and if we don't know scrofulous, we should look it up. So a scrofulous French novel on gray paper with blunt type. Oh my goodness, my dear students, it's a French novel. What do we think about the French? Well, <laughs> he says, simply glance at it and you grovel hand and foot in Belial's gripe. So all Brother Lawrence would have to do is, you know, well, if our speaker left it out and it happened to be open to the woeful 16th print, uh, and he happened to glance at it. Oh, that's it. He's going off to hell. Of course, if we are careful readers, we should think to ourselves, why does this Why does this monk even have a scrofulous French novel? It is because he himself is flawed. He himself is sinning. He is a hypocrite. And so he is perhaps already, already in Satan's grip. And if we have any doubt of that before... The final stanza leads us to that conclusion. So we have, or there's Satan. For a monk to even be consi considering Satan, that in itself is a bad thing. But he says, one might venture, pledge one's soul to him. Well, as readers, we should wonder if he, that if he hasn't, in fact, already done just that thing, pledged his soul to Satan so that he would make a deal with him to send Brother Lawrence to hell. But of course... You know, and he says here, yet leave such a flaw in the indenture as he'd miss. In other words, he's saying we could pledge our soul to Satan, but we'll have a loophole, just a little flaw so that Satan will never really see it uh, until it's too late and past retrieve and blasted lay that rose acacia we're so proud of. And when he says we're so proud of, what he's really talking about is Brother Lawrence's rose acacia that he is so proud of. So again, this is far beyond just some petty little mention of, oh, he doesn't lay his knife and fork in the shape of a cross or, uh, or even, you know, he's annoying, but he's taking steps to damn him to hell, which as we have said before, makes us wonder if of course this speaker isn't already, hasn't already committed his soul there. Um, and so he says, uh, we have this language here, hine, as if he is chanting some sort of a curse. And then our last two lines here, just there's Vespers. Vespers is, and if we don't know, as I have said before, guess what? Look it up, my dear students. Vespers would be a particular time of day uh, in the, the monastery um a call to order, you know, you have the, the day itself is split up into different times and Vespers is one of those times. So he leads into plena gratia ave virgo, full of grace uh, is the Virgin, the Virgin Mary. So he is shifted back into his, into his, and he's saying this out loud and we see the, uh, the italics once again, that would be our poetic devices. Um, we see either the language of Brother Lawrence or the language of our speaker joining in as if he is just like every other monk, but he's not. And we see that because we shift out of the italics. So this is atten attention to syntax. We see, grr, you swine. And again, our tone, grr, you swine. It is bestial. It is animalistic. So, and if we are careful, we will note that this is the exact same phrasing that the entire poem began with. So, we can see that really he has always been like this. And if we add on to this last line, the idea that he is already contemplating Satan, the idea that he is growling, growling 
it is in fact indicative that perhaps his soul has already been committed to Satan and that he is he has become as bestial as Satan himself. And that's why um, he is such a hypocrite and he wishes these horrible things on Brother Lawrence. So as we go through, we have given attention to tone. That is, we see uh, a, a, progress, a progression in tone from simply being annoyed to, to really this almost bestial tone. This is, he, is, he is furious with, uh, with Brother Lawrence, and he wants his eternal damnation. Our eternal internal structure, we see him moving through his day. And so the internal structure, remember, my dear students, internal structure would be the linear order of the storyline itself within the poem. And so the progression of the narrative, we see him in the beginning of the day and then taking his meal, him going outside to the garden, and then moving through the day all the way to the end towards Vespers. So it is a linear internal structure where we follow this priest through his day as he is following Brother Lawrence and in his head, he is complaining about him, and but not just complaining, planning his damnation. Within poetic devices, our next one here, certainly we can see attention to uh, italics to show us the inner thoughts. I mean, sorry, not the inner thoughts, to show us uh, Brother Lawrence's, um, his speech patterns and what he says, um, that, that the, the discourse and the dialogue that he gives us in contrast to our speaker's speech. Um and that repetition, gur, you swine, that's also, um, and actually that speaks towards external structure because it begins and ends the same, gur, you swine, that he wants to trap him, that he is really, he growls as if he's an animal himself. Uh, language and diction, surely we can see um, the attention to the language that would show us the religious language, references to Satan, references to Vespers, the Latin here, plena gratia, ave virgo. So all of these are Galatians, a book of the Bible. So uh, our poet, Robert Browning, has given great attention to the language that should be spoken by someone of the cloth, someone of the faith, and yet... We see by everything else in these um, elements of poetry that he is a hypocrite and he doesn't act like a priest is supposed to act. Um, and so our external structure begins and ends with the growling. And uh, we can see just as we progress through the poem, it is worse and worse. It is as if we are descending further and further down, guess what, my dears, into hell itself just as the soul of our speaker has descended as well. And so, if we give careful attention to elements of poetry, we can take a poem that is, yes, admittedly a difficult poem, and yet if we take it apart piece by piece and we use the elements of poetry, we can absolutely find deep meaning. And I know that you all can do this too. Thank you, my dears, and I hope you enjoyed the poem. <laughs>